It's a slight amendment to Professor Weston. You said that I can speak authoritatively on just about anything about China. I would say I sound authoritative. <laughs> <laughs> That's really my life. Uh, I, I think you could take all of the China experts in this country and put them in the same room together and multiply by 2,000. And what you would have is about this much of the enormous amount of knowledge and information and change that is China. So nobody knows it all or even close to it. Plus, it's constantly changing. So unfortunately, I can't talk to you today about the recent major changes in China because uh, my wife and I haven't been there for almost a month now. We were there this summer, so I can only talk, uh, as you could, on, on the basis of what we've been reading since I've been there. But I'm curious, have you, folk, have you really read that book, Man Who Stayed Behind? I asked um, Dr. Weston, he said, yes, I'm sure, because they wrote papers on it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand students. Has anybody read a novel by the old English uh, writer Thomas Hardy called Return of the Native? No, neither have I, but I read a very presentable book report. <laughs> I looked it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. It was quite authoritative, and I got a good mark on it. So, anyway. Um, you know, I've lived through a number of different Chinas so far. And uh, when I say different, I mean cataclysmically different. When I first got to that country as a GI in the U.S. Army in 1945, about 70% of the population lived in the normal state for them was hunger. If you talk to people in the countryside and you say it as we do, you don't say it like this in Chinese, but we do. We say, what do you do, like for a living? And people wouldn't say, I'm a farmer or I farm. They'd say, well, so cool. I suffer. Farming was suffering. Most, the great majority, were landless tenants that worked for the great landlord. Or they had so little land that they had to spend most of their time working on the landlord's land. And the wives and daughters often had to go to the landlord's home to do the threshing, the sewing, the whatever uh, needed to be done without pay. And this kind of, and of course, there was no semblance of any kind of rights. The word wasn't known either. When you walked along the village street with one of the great gentry, the Ordinary people would stand to one side like this while the great master went by. And that's the way it was. It was total oppression. Usually there'd be one or two people in the village that could read and write like their own names. And the village schoolmaster, if there was one, could read and write. But that was it. And um, so what do you have today? You have a country where the problem of food, shelter, and clothing at the basic level is solved. You still have a certain percentage of the population that live below the poverty line. But I hate to have to say this, it is a smaller percentage than we have in our country. And we are the richest country in the world. Okay? Don't think that because we've been through this terrible recession that we're not the richest country in the world. Because if you notice, the very, very rich people have continued to get richer and richer every year during the recession. This doesn't seem to have come to the attention of the voters for some reason, but maybe sooner or later it will. 
So in China today, you have a kind of confidence that we're not going to starve to death. We're not going to freeze in winter. We're not going to be thrown out because we can't pay the rent. And this is something new. But that's just sort of the basic ground view of Chinese society today. What may or may not surprise you is, I was asked last night, someone said, what about cell phones, how many cell phones they have? Well, they have 800 million cell phones. So any bright young guy or gal will have two or three cell phones, which they use for different lines of callers. And they have cell phones which we have never seen or even dreamed of. All shapes, forms, colors, rings, and so on. Even Motorola manufactures cell phones in China that they don't make here and that you can't buy here. So, how many people subscribe to the internet? 400 million. Um, unlike us, however, 70% of the time spent on the internet is games and music. So only 30% is informational, political, and so on and so forth. We know that the uh, Chinese government monitors the internet, and when you're there, like when we were there last month or the month before, you can't get into Twitter or Facebook you can get into LinkedIn, so there's some that are open, some that are not, but the most popular ones you can't access. And there's some websites that have political content that you can't access, except that you can. So all we did was got a VPN address from a friend and set up a VPN link with a server that's not inside China. You can get anything you like, just like here. It's really very simple. So why do they spend all that money to do that and with so little effect? Well, that's something they have to answer, I really can. But it's a losing game, and I'm sure that sooner or later they'll give it up. Um, so life is just infinitely better in terms of individual freedom. I'm not talking about things like electoral freedom. But just individual personal freedom. People are freer than at any time in Chinese history. Way, way, way more. You have the freedom to pick your job if you can find it. You're not bound to a government job. You can quit. You can go into business. You can go into business with foreigners. You can leave China and go to a foreign country. The only limit on the number of Chinese who come to this country is on our side, because we limit the visas to 26,000 a year. On their side, there's no limit whatsoever. You want to go? Be my guest. You just have to go and line up at the American consulate and hope you get a break. And the way that you get a visa is you really have to relieve the suspicion on the side of the American consul that you may not be really planning to come back. Because there's fear about population coming over and taking jobs and so on and so forth. So, and there is freedom to criticize and to complain. If you take a bus or a train in China, especially the trains is longer, you sit in a compartment with four to six other people. People complain so much about the government, naming names, specific policy. You'd think you were on the New York subway. <laughs> and nobody pays any attention, nobody cares, no big deal. So the picture that we get sometimes in this country of China as a land of darkness, like Nazi Germany, is just totally false. Totally false. I mean, it's not even close. All you have to do is walk down the street and see the expressions on people's faces and hear them humming or singing as they walk along, see them smile at you, and you know whatever this is, it is not a land of darkness. 
Okay. The two things that you can't do. It's interesting. I just read a biography of Spinoza, the Dutch uh, philosopher. And in Spinoza's day, 400 years ago, give or take, in Holland, there were the same two things that you couldn't do, and two things alone. If you have a position <coughs> which, is, which challenges the right of the Communist Party to rule, doesn't matter if it's about the economy. If you want to write an article saying the government stimulus program is all wrong, it's piling up trouble for the future, you can do it and it will be published. Or if you want to complain about the health delivery system or whatever, as long as you don't challenge the right of the Communist Party to rule, you can say or write what you please. But if you do challenge and you write it down and publish it, or if you have a meeting to organize for what you advocate against fundamental government structure, then you're in trouble. If you persist in doing that, then you're going to go through to a forced education program or, if it's serious, maybe even to prison. There is an electoral system. Everybody is elected. But who is going to be elected doesn't really keep you guessing. Usually the number one person, so the mayor, the governor, the central leader, is a, you're going to have only one candidate with money. So that makes it rather easy and inexpensive. Uh, in the case of the vice mayor in a place like Shanghai, there'll be more than one candidate. And you won't really know which one but you will know that he's going to represent the Communist Party. There's no question about that. And if he doesn't, he will be removed from whatever office he was elected to. So, in that sense, there is not uh, political freedom. So you can talk, but you can't write or organize. But, <coughs> compared to the old days, when you couldn't talk, it's a huge advance. And in the, the Cultural Revolution, which we all know was a terrible holocaust, okay, got me reinstalled in solitary confinement for another 10 years, and lots of people died. Nobody knows how many, really. And it was pretty horrible. But it is a fact that the Cultural Revolution, historically, in my view, had tremendously progressive importance in two areas, at least. One is that after the Cultural Revolution, when people believed so fanatically in the great leader, the infallible doctrine, and the one church the organization, and then that belief was reduced to absurdity and punctured and failed, so that nobody believed in it anymore. What that did was open everybody's mind so that people do not take anything just because he said so and he's a great leader. There is no more great leader. China today is a country that's ruled at the top there's a nine-man standing committee of the political bureau of the central committee of the Communist Party of China, and I could even add a few more lines if you want. But there's nine men who really are in charge at the strategic level of everything that happens. And, but there is no predominant leader who calls the shots. No more, not since Deng Xiaoping. So what you have is nine people really re rep representing different interest groups, different viewpoints. And the job of the party leader, in this case, Hu Jintao, the president, his job is to work towards a consensus, a least common denominator that all nine can sign off on, and then go with that, whatever it is. And all nine are supposed to confine whatever they say and do to whatever it was agreed on. So it is ruled by consensus. 
It is not anything like a one-man dictatorship. And that's also very different from the old days. And one reason for that is that the Cultural Revolution blew away the very concept of having an infallible leader and an infallible doctrine. It opened people's minds so that they think critically. So when they read an article in the Central Party newspaper, the People's Daily, which incidentally very, very few people read, except for government workers who have to read it to know what the policy is, and people like me who read it online every day faithfully, also just to figure out what's going on. And you have to learn over time how to read it so you can see what it's really saying because at first reading it looks like it's not saying anything. So anyway, um, what's the thread? Why, why was that? Friend me about um, People's Daily. What's in the People's Daily? Yeah. Did you get two good results in the Cultural Revolution? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So, people used to take that as the word from the hill. That's the way things are. It says so here in the paper or on TV, which is also, of course, party. <coughs> now, nobody thinks like that anymore. People read it and then they think for themselves is it really so? You know, why are they saying this? Is it really so? Et cetera, et cetera. And this is a very, very important change historically that augurs very well for the future. Sooner or later, they certainly would have come to critical thinking, but it might have taken much longer. I'm not saying that it was great, fortunate to have the Cultural Revolution. It was not fortunate, but we're talking about analyzing it after it happened. We're not saying that's a choice that we would have made. That we would have made that's a fact. Um, so anyway, that's just uh, sort of a starter, and the main thing is to invite you to ask questions, and please, uh, no holes barred, because I'm really interested in seeing what you're interested in, because that's the way where the sons up here learn, and uh, it, it's really the best way to learn. And you have lots of questions. In you, I know from the experience of my students that uh, nobody else has even thought of. I'm not it. So, 